Hello and welcome to episode 14 of the Farm One podcast. And this time I've uh, got a special episode. We're going to be talking to a good friend of mine and also a really great inspiring figure on the urban ag scene. It's Harrison Hillier from uh, Teens for Food Justice or TFFJ, if you want to be brief about it. Uh, and I'm sitting here in Farm One. Uh, Harrison's over in his place in New York, and we're going to kind of dive in and, and learn a bit more about what the folks at Teens for Food Justice do. Uh, we might touch on some little bits of engineering and tips for how to build hydroponic systems uh, and talk about you know food systems and all that good stuff. So welcome, Harrison. Good to see you today. Thanks. Good to see you too. Yeah. And again, congratulations. Couldn't be couldn't be happier for you and the missus. That's fantastic. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thanks. I appreciate it. Um, so let's start off. Uh, you know, why don't you tell our audience who you are, what you do, and how you got into uh, this whole bit of urban agriculture? Sure. Uh, well, as they already know, uh, my name is Harrison Hillier. So at Teens for Food Justice, I'm the senior hydroponic systems manager, uh, which means that. Uh, I, I design the systems that we use. I also design the farm layouts and collaborate with um, the various uh, stakeholders that help us put the farms together. So that's um, contractors, um, different uh, uh, officials within the schools that we build in. And then I also oversee the uh, the actual rollout of the farm build and I guess the commissioning of the systems. Yeah. Um, yeah okay. So I'm actually from Maryland originally. I was born in uh, at Shady Grove uh, Hospital in Durwood, Maryland. And uh, I've always, I've consistently had an interest in agriculture throughout, throughout my life. We had a nice uh, big backyard and a garden um, that we'd spend a lot of time cultivating things in. And, uh, I think that the the happiest memories I have are tied to when our garden was doing the best. So I think I was predisposed to being a plant person right from the jump and then decided that I wanted to get into uh, greenhouse production in high school. Um, actually, for, I, what I wanted to do was have a place where my friends could work and and make a living while they sorted themselves out because uh, you know most of my friends were fairly aimless came from troubled backgrounds and so i kind of wanted to make sure that they all had a place uh, a safe space to kind of sort themselves um and so i thought that would be that'd be a good way to do it um yeah yeah okay cool way to get started what age were you when you were sort of starting to mess around with greenhouses then and, and get your hands um, kind of dirty, so I guess? That would have been, with greenhouses, that would have been, uh, it wasn't until I went to, to get, get my bachelor's, to be honest. I, initially, I got an uh, Associates of Arts in at uh, Montgomery College, uh, Montgomery Community College, because uh, I wanted to be a ceramicist. And realized that that actually meant I wanted to be an art teacher, which is not what I wanted to do. <laughs> so I shifted um, and uh, shifted my focus to plant and soil science. Uh, and while I was at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore, so that's the HBC, uh, HBCU um, sister school to College Park. It's out on the panhandle of Maryland. If any of your listeners are familiar, that's deep in the country uh, mm -hmm. on the east side of Maryland. Mm -hmm. And got a job uh, working with their uh, soil studies program, which had greenhouses and helped a gentleman uh, with his master's program studying soil funguses impact on growing scotch bonnets. Uh, and from there, kind of just started tinkering and assembling my own systems in some some underutilized space in some of their hoop houses uh, that they had there and found that that was really rewarding. So naturally, I immediately shifted my focus again. And sorry, I live uh, across the street from a hospital. So hopefully the, the traffic yeah. won't be too disruptive. That's cool. Um, so I shifted my focus again to plant breeding. 
I wanted to, this is right around um, the time of the Fukushima uh, event. And what I wanted to do was grow special sunflowers so that they could help remediate the, the radioactive metals out of the soil water and or the water that was in, in the soil from the reactors. And then got into a grad program at North Carolina State um, working with sweet potatoes. And uh, my whole focus was using microbiology to uh, map out their genome, which I found was not what I wanted to do because while plant breeding is endlessly fascinating, it's also incredibly dry in practice. Yeah. It is very much a application of statistics. So rather than working with plants directly, you spend most of your time working with Excel directly. Yeah. And if you can't, if you can't get your brain hooked on it, if you can't buy into that, to that world, that very abstract world, it's, it's not for you. Um, yeah. And so I, you know, decided to uproot and come to New York City. And I worked for a couple of uh, nonprofits. I worked for Sprout by Design, helping them uh, run a small hydroponics uh, tower garden in a juvenile detention center out in Brownsville. Um, I worked with Grow NYC out on Governor's Island. And through that, I was linked with uh, Kathy Saul, who uh, needed a hydroponics aficionado to help her with a project uh, at DeWitt Clinton High School in the Bronx. Yeah. So that's how you got started with Teens for Food Justice then. And like, and, and tell us, so what is Teens for Food Justice? So uh, TFFJ, right, to keep it brief, is a 501c3 nonprofit. Our core mission is to ensure that all New Yorkers have access to fresh, healthy food and to end the cycle of health com health complications um, that are unequally impacting uh, low-income New Yorkers of color. Uh, we're doing this by galvanizing a youth-led movement within Title I middle and high schools in the city's food deserts and training students on indoor hydroponic uh, uh, vertical systems um, to grow thousands of pounds. Like this is very much farming equipment brought into schools. Um, and the, that produce gets served largely to the cafeteria with excess going to programs like um, City Harvest. Uh, there's donation, there's different, there's various organizations that we donate the excess to to make sure that it gets out to those, like the rest of the community. Uh, yeah. And we also use these farms as learning centers for advocacy, uh, community advocacy and entrepreneurship. We integrate farm-based lessons into the school's STEM classes and run an after-school program with the aim to empower students to speak out on issues of food justice or food injustice that's affecting their communities. So tell us like a little bit about, you know, these kids, these teenagers, these uh, folks who are sort of you're trying to serve with your farms. What are they like? What do people need to know about them? And, you know, we have listeners who are in New York City, but also people outside. And it'd be great to understand, you know, what are the dynamics that these kids are facing and, and, and you know, why do you do what you do? Uh, what it, I just want to give a, a, a an answer that does them justice because they are kids you know, and, and children are children the world over, but these populations are, they deal with, with issues every day that I, most of the adults I know are not equipped to deal with. They deal with violence. Um, they deal with, uh, you know, not being able to get enough food. A lot of them have to be the parent to their, uh, younger siblings. Um, and then, uh, just the, the disillusionment that can come with being, uh, systematically oppressed. So it's like, it's difficult enough being a teenager, but then when you start to wake up to how the system is really tilted and rigged against you, it's like the ennui, the depression, they have to fight through all of that. But when they do and they get the opportunity to engage in these sorts of programs, uh, that's that's a big reason why I take so much personal gratification in the job that I do, because I could take my skills and apply them elsewhere. 
Um, I could go into the for-profit world. I could, uh, I could go for commercial cultivation, but that doesn't have the same impact. You know, there are a plethora of producers of one shape or size throughout the world. There's not a plethora of teens for food justices out mm -hmm. there. So I'm happy that I can, that's why I personally do this. Yeah. But when you afford these students, um, this kind of very unique opportunity and they get to internalize that they and their friends and their community are worthy of this unique opportunity. You get to see them just be like kids and they get to be curious and they get to kind of push, put aside all of the unfair things that they have to deal with every day yeah. that are not their fault, but you know, are, are, pushed upon them and they get to just kind of see what a cucumber looks like growing up. Or when we release ladybugs, they get to kind of just watch them do their thing. And it's, that's, they're just kids that have not been given a fair shake. And I think that that's part of, part of why we do what we do. Yeah. And, and tell us, you know, what's, what's a typical interaction that a kid might have with one of your farms or one of your staff and like, how do they, you know, what, what's like the first moment that they might, you know, discover TFFJ and, and what might they be doing at that point? So I think the first moment honestly is one of my favorite moments. Cause there's, it's the first time they walk into the farm. And if they weren't part of the initial crew to help build the farm, which some students get the opportunity to help, assemble our systems, they walk into this wall of green that has, that they didn't even know was there. And so there's this big wow factor because no one expects, no one expects to walk into an indoor farm on the third floor of a high school in the Bronx. Um, but what they will be doing is it's a mix. It's a, a, a blend of uh, curricular programming that TFFJ staff has, has, uh, compiled in conjunction with the, the NYC's DOE STEM programming. It will be delivered by uh, a, a teacher uh, from the school with the help of our farmer educator, which is what we call our basically a person who operates our farms. They have that dual role of being a farmer and being an educator, hence the name farmer educator. Some days the students will be working directly hands-on with the crops, um, largely around things like seeding, transplanting, harvesting, um, and other times they'll be doing lessons around nutrition or advocacy um, or social justice. But also there have been instances where other, uh, other disciplines within the school, so like an English teacher will wanna bring students into the farm to read a book about to, uh, about farming or, mm -hmm. or poetry that has to do with nature. So the way that students can interact with the farm can is, it varies. It's lots of different potential ways that they could do this. We also have an after school program um, that is more focused on just the TFFJ curriculum. So uh, it, they do things like um, survey different places to buy food around uh, around their neighborhood and get a bit more into the details of the actual cultivation and propagation. Yeah, yeah. And and so what is it do you think about farming because obviously there's a you know there's a lot of organizations in New York City doing various things with food. You know, you've mentioned City Harvest already, you know, there's Rethink, there's there's a bunch of folks doing things with food banks, you know, there's um, maybe education on farms like upstate, that kind of thing. But what is it, why is it so important to have farms in the city, in schools that, that kids can interact with, you know, directly? I think, I think no matter where you're from, it, it's easy to take agriculture for granted. Mm -hmm. um, and it is easy to kind of set aside or, or, or not really acknowledge how much power one is afforded by being able to grow their own food or to know how to grow their own food. Um, it's so fundamental to everything that we do as a species uh, post hunting and gathering. You know, 
agriculture is the reason that we could stop being migratory or as migratory or rather forced to be migratory. Mm -hmm. So giving people the opportunity to, from seed to harvest, grow something. And then the, the further experience of, um, of actually preparing food with things that you've grown, it gives you a sense of agency and a sense of control. And, um, yeah, so I think that's part of the reason why it's so important to, to have farms. Like it is, it is incredibly important. All of the work in the, in the food supply system is incredibly important, but knowing where it starts from, it connects us back to, to our roots, um, as a species not even just like as a community or as a people, but it's like, this is so fundamental. And you don't think about that because we've gotten really good at streamlining the process in a way mm-hmm. that kind of tucks it away out of, out of, uh, out of view. Yeah. Yeah. And what, you know, what's, what's the typical experience that a teenager that you work with, like, are they, I mean, it, this is obvious. It's like a softball question, but have they been to a farm before? Have they seen food being made? Like, have they seen you know our food system like that, or is this you know one of the first times that they actually get get to see stuff? Uh, I mean, of, of course, these kids have many different life experiences, and you know, none of none of their communities are monolithic. Some of them have been to farms. Some of them have been to community gardens. I think more likely they've been to a community garden. And mm-hmm. so they understand that scale of food production. I think, you know, everyone has seen food being prepared. And I think that, um, that that is one of the touchstones that, that TFFJ uses to connect with their students because we do food demonstrations and we do recipes. And, and so I think that that's an easy connect because a lot of people have watched their parents uh, uh, cook or they have find that the rewarding part of interacting with food. Um, I kind of, uh, there, there was, I guess it's a joke or, or it's like, I don't know what you'd call it, but this notion that people think food comes from the grocery store in the agricultural community, especially, especially in the more rural soil-based agricultural communities, they have a chuckle, like, how could you be so ignorant? No one thinks that. No one thinks that food comes from the grocery store. Um, but I do think that uh, these students have a very, what can I eat right now um, that is the most satisfying? Mm. So a lot of that is high sugar, high salt, um, high carbohydrates, meat forward, and veggies in the back sort of interaction. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I don't blame them. I do it too, especially when I was in high school. I do it now. You know, I'm in my 30s. I still do that to a shameful degree. But when I was in high school, you couldn't stop me from yeah. eating junk food and, and uh, drinking sodas because that's my agent. It's my body. I'll do what I wish with it. And I can, I can have these luxuries. So, you know. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was the same. I mean, when I was a teenager, my diet was about 40% chicken nuggets, um, <laughs> yes. you know, 30% like some kind of fried potato product. And mm-hmm. then maybe if you're lucky, some broccoli would like squeeze in at the end, you know? Yeah. Um, but what, you know, certainly, and what we've found, um, when kids come to our farms is you're right. Like everyone's got a different experience and some kids are really into, you know, really bold flavors and they're adventurous. And then, and then other folks are actually pretty scared to eat a leaf, like off a plant, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, And I guess what's interesting about growing the things that you primarily grow, you know, you're growing leafy greens and you're growing things like that um, is that that's often like the last thing on a kid's mind, right? It's like, as you said, I want to get energy. I want to eat something that's, you know, full of energy, maybe like it's satisfying in the moment. And so leafy greens are kind of the last thing, but also they're often a really, really expensive thing, you know, for someone to spend money on. What, what, what's your experience of like getting kids around leafy greens more and like what does, you know, how does that change their attitude to it? And it is sometimes I'm guess you're, you're giving access to this, this food that maybe, yeah, like very infrequently kids are going to try, you know? Oh yeah. Um, 
there is definitely the the that's nasty factor. Um, one of the one of the people that TFFJ has had the pleasure of collaborating with, George Edwards, um, is has said that you're going to get a lot of kids going. That's nasty, and it's like freshly grown greens. It's basil that's just been harvested. It's not nasty. It's it's a premium a premium <laughs> product that we are happy right. to to let you have for free. Please eat up, but. Uh, their their experience or or most people's experience with lettuce is iceberg lettuce, you know, and it's it's technically it's lettuce, but it's you know it's what goes on a subway sandwich, or um, or or any any number of fast food items. So when you get them around um, leafy greens, and then you get them past the that's nasty phase, they really do enjoy it um and and they get enthusiastic about it and they want to share it with their peers i remember at one of our farms in um at our farm in bed we got some seeds donated that were these heirloom peppers they were little they're like uh fishers pippin's fish peppers i think <laughs> teeny little things like a little thai pepper low heat and the first time these kids uh middle schoolers ate these peppers uh you the would have thought fireworks were going off they were so enthusiastic they started grabbing up all their friends they wanted us to take videos of them eating these peppers like it was yeah like it was a viral challenge yeah. and it was it's one of my fondest memories because yeah. they couldn't get enough of it and it was just this new novel experience um yeah. but you know like you said some some students aren't as enthusiastic but I think they, even those students really like the community, the kind of like the little in crowd, I get to go work on the farm and have this unique experience that even the most cynical of teenagers or middle schoolers, they have a hard time resisting that feeling. And then, so we try and we take that and we channel it into um, getting them to feel the same way about eating the, the lettuce in the cafeteria. Because again, the bulk of this produce is going into the cafeteria for like salad bars and things like that. So one of our challenges is um, channeling that feeling like you're proud to eat it here in the farm. You got it yeah. past that. It's nasty hurdle. Now take it to the cafeteria and show everyone that this is worth eating and it's good. And uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, very cool. And, and, you know, school cafeterias feed a lot of folks. Right. And so, mm -hmm. Uh, and I know one of the cool things, you know, about TFFFJ, TFFJ, let's give it three Fs. I'm not sure. Uh, TFFJ is, is that for fun. <laughs> <laughs> is that you actually build farms that are significant in size. I mean, they're churning yeah. out a good quantity of produce. Can you give us some examples of, of what these farms are like? Where are they? How big they are? And, and what kind of volumes of produce they might typically produce? Right. So, um, we have we currently have farms in uh brooklyn in manhattan we've got two in brooklyn one in manhattan uh one in the bronx we are in the pipeline to open one out in on far rockaway um, and these farms are as well as uh we have projects opening actually uh in denver and in miami um, we're trying to replicate this in other because you know new york is not the only place with title one schools new york is not the only place with food deserts these issues are they're global but at the very least they're across america yeah, and so yeah. we're trying to expand to address those uh far uh, at home and, and abroad uh but we work uh in a uh, we found our sweet spot is really about a thousand square feet that's where um 1000 to 1500 is where we can find a nice ratio between learning space and uh, growing systems. The smallest space we work in, which is one standard New York classroom, is uh, 560 square feet. And that can be, that space is, is difficult to split the difference within, although we've kind of replicated that in our sites in Brooklyn. So our site in bed that I was just talking about at Urban Assembly Unison uh, Middle, is 560 square feet 
that is really trended more towards a learning space. So that can put out a little more than a thousand pounds a year, um, which, but, but it has a comfortable amount of space for a full classroom of students and, uh, and teachers and volunteer staff back when we could have that many people in such a small space. Sure. Um, and hopefully fingers crossed, we're not far from being able to get back there safely. And then out at uh, the Brownsville Collaborative Middle School, we have another 560 square foot space that um, uh, is packed out for growing. So it can put out something like uh, four to 5,000 pounds a year, but yeah. it, is, it is difficult to, it's, you have to be very mindful about how you're bringing students in and out of the room. Um, and it, it's more of a challenge. There's less human space in that one uh, just because of the, the, the needs of the school and their uh, uh, focuses, their yeah. Yeah. priorities, their priorities for what they want out of that, out of that space. At our farm in Manhattan, that's a 1300 square foot space. And that's about a 60, 40 split between growing systems and, and learning space. Uh, and then our site up in the Bronx is at the DeWitt Clinton high school. That's a 1500 square foot, uh, uh, science classroom that was being used as a enormous storage closet. And so we were able to like revitalize that space. It was being underutilized and now, uh, Again, it's it's a little bit more towards a 70-30 split, which we find is a little bit congested. Um, and if we could sandbox that space, we'd probably change up the the layout. And you know, that was the second installation that I was uh, part of at TFFJ. And it's every time we learn so much about not just the nuts and bolts, but also the human element of the school. Um, how important it is to manage those relationships, how important it is to stay on top of things like distribution and really from the jump, understand what the school's goals are for the farm. And even sometimes temper those expectations. Um, so the DeWitt Clinton farm can put out uh, close to 10,000, I think it's like 8,500 pounds of produce a year. MLK is just a little bit less than that. Um, but what's most important is uh, people can get, they get lured in by that big number. And yeah. in a, in a classroom, you know, in, in uh, Manhattan, that's, that's a ton of food to put out. It's actually a few tons of food to put out every year. <laughs> yeah. So you have to make sure that they know or at least help them refine their ideas of how is this going to be used? Because if it's not used properly, that's several tons of food waste. And that's not what we do. That's not what TFFJ is about. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's important that every, every last head of lettuce or cucumber or a bunch of basil gets used as effectively as possible. Yeah. So the bigger the farm, the bigger the responsibility that is. Yeah. And I, I mean, obviously, I think, you know, there's other folks who are putting smaller units in purely mm -hmm. for education. Um, of course, there's people doing things when schools have outdoor spaces, doing, you know, other right. kinds, kinds of approaches. Um, what what kind of, for instance, like what kind of crops are you growing on your farms and why are you choosing those crops um, as opposed to others? What, what's the best sort of way to use this space most effectively to grow things? Right. So we grow assorted leafy greens. So um, things like butterhead lettuces. Uh, we also grow uh, different varieties of basil, oregano and thyme. Uh, so we, we have one, one menu sort of that is a small form factor and a quick turnaround time in terms of from seed to harvest. Yeah. And we put those in vertical shallow raft culture systems, actually not unlike uh, what you're sitting in front of right now with uh, uh, our, <laughs> sorry, I love, I love the Vanna White. You're like, yeah, good. <laughs> um, our grow methodology is, is different from yours in that 
we're looking for biomass and a relatively quick turnover. So our tray depth is a little narrower and our shelf, our intershelf height is also a little bit uh, narrower so that we can get more shelves and, and get those quicker turnover crops um, yeah. that really have been proven to grow well indoors. Now, the other menu that we work from are different fruiting crops. Mostly we grow cucumbers, specifically parthenocarpic cucumbers, meaning that they self-pollinate um, and will just kind of produce fruit throughout their lifespan. Um, we also will sometimes grow sweet peppers uh, of different different varieties, different colors. The mm -hmm. reason we used to grow tomatoes, and of course, tomatoes have a time honored tradition of being grown indoors hydroponically. But for us, because we are a, a good amount of the people working on our farm are students, and while it is fun to hand pollinate tomato plants or pepper plants a few times, it is mind numbing to do it every single day and to do it as thoroughly as one has to to get the yield that makes it um that Worthwhile. makes it okay yeah. to give up that real estate yeah so especially with tomatoes if you are not on top of pruning if you're not getting uh if you're not uh carefully managing the growth of the plant to make sure that it's uh effectively that you've got your, your just a few areas of growth that are really putting out yield. And if you're not thoroughly pollinating them, you're not going to get anything. You're going to get big old tomato plants that you cannot eat. Yeah. Um, and so yeah. it's a waste of space and it's a waste of resource and it's not a rewarding experience for the students. Uh, the pepper plants, it's the same it, it has many of the same hangups, but it's a smaller, more compact, compact variety that we work with. So it's a little bit more manageable. Um, but with these parthenocarpic cucumbers, uh, really, we just have to make sure that they get up to, we use a, a canopy that once our vines get up to the canopy, they can spread out and we let them decide how much is, or uh, how to best utilize the light that we're giving them. Yeah. To that canopy there's a lot less pruning work that we do we just make yeah. sure that the fruits aren't being caught up in that canopy that they're making it and hanging down under the canopy for a nice easy ergonomic harvesting and we can yield significant amounts of cucumbers that way um so yeah i, I think that that's those are our two main uh, reasons is one group the leafy greens have they're practically set and forget and for our vining crops, we, we have to choose ones that are as set and forget as possible. They require some pruning, but not a lot. And they will produce a yield that justifies uh, giving up that real estate because we could build a different kind of system there. We could use yeah. it more effectively. Um, so, yeah, that's yeah. but that's the two varieties or the two two wheelhouses that we yeah. um, uh, specialize in. And also those are crops that it would be difficult to grow, difficult if not impossible to grow outdoors in the winter. Um, and so some of our schools do have outdoor programs. DeWitt Clinton High School has an outdoor garden. And I would like to think that they could be utilizing their space in a more rewarding way um, or in, in terms of crop selection rather than growing heads of lettuce. You know, we can do that inside. We can do that all day, all year. So, yeah. you know, grow some callaloo, grow some some stuff that like it may be more culturally relevant to the population that is going to that school. Or maybe it's just more fun to watch grow and and have that rewarding outdoor experience. And, yeah. you know, kind of don't don't waste your space with heads of lettuce. <laughs> we can do that inside. So, so and and so talking about one of those heads of lettuce, right? So you've you've talked about how it, it ends up in the cafeteria. Mm -hmm. Ideally, it ends up on someone's plate, and they're eating yeah. some salad, or they're putting it, you know, uh, on a sandwich or something like that. So um, before it gets harvested, or before it gets to the cafeteria, what are the kind of touch points that the teenagers have with that crop, like mm. all the way back to it being planted? Um. So if assuming that there's not a uh, like a special project, right? So a biology teacher hasn't come in and said, hey, I want 
this group of students to observe the growth of these plants over time. Because in that case, it's many different touch points. It's an observational study of how the plants grow. Mm. But if this is uh, one of our heads that is is just being grown to be harvested and eaten, not just, but that's, that's its life story, the students will come in and plant the seeds. Um, and then once the seeds have been germinated, so we use um, cocoa plugs. We at one point were using loose coir, but the issue there was getting the seedling back up out of the tray without the plug disintegrating or uh, the seedling being damaged and then just dying off. Um, so once we've, once the seed is germinated in that plug, uh, the students come back and they'll transplant it into a, a, a it's basically it's finishing system. So we have one transplant step and that system will be dictated by the farmer educator uh, and then they it'll grow. It'll live its yeah. life until it's reached maturity. Um, and then the students will come back through and, and will harvest that uh, and then deliver it to the cafeteria. Right. So that's, I mean, we try and minimize actual touch points because these are food products. And yeah. so food safety is at the forefront of our mind. And we have a great track record uh, in, in those terms. Um, so yeah, yeah it, it is, there is a certain amount, especially in the middle school of making sure the kids aren't touching the plants, um, which is a Herculean task because they're fascinating. Why wouldn't you want to touch the plants? So we kind of make sure that everyone's wearing gloves, make sure everyone's washed their hands. Um, we make sure everyone's wearing shoe covers so that when a student succumbs to their curiosity, they're not contaminating the food. Um, yeah, so yeah. they are yeah. involved in the whole process from seed to harvest and even to the delivery within the school. Yeah, yeah. And, and so to set up a system like these, you know, when you walk in, because, you know, you're one, but a, a lead engineer effectively on a lot of these projects, right? And so we, when you walk into a school, how do you, how do you get a farm in a school? I mean, like, that's the question. How do you build a farm in a school? Like, because when I, you know, um, when I visited you guys at MLK, um, you know, I had the experience, I, I walked in. Uh, that's a school that tends to have a lot of security on it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you walk through the metal detector, you walk past a lot of cops, you you know, and so it's it's quite a, um, you know, and the architecture is quite sort of brutal, I got to say. It's yeah. a, a very sort of, um, you know, difficult building to imagine, you know, a farm. And it, it's kind of the exactly the same experience that you talked about. It's like you walk down the hall and then all of a sudden you see, bright lights you see the green you see these lush plants which by the way look super healthy when i was there um really really nicely maintained system and a really clean room um but yeah how do you make that happen because schools are like you know i remember my schools growing up you know sometimes it was like a temporary classroom sometimes the floor was falling apart sometimes you know like there's oh, yeah. no ventilation all this kind of thing how do you build a farm in a school uh it is it is 20% building the systems and 80% collaboration. So there is a lot of, a lot of social capital and trust. Um, you have to have buy-in from the administration. You have to, um, I mean, the Kevin Froner at MLK was integral in getting that, in getting that farm set up because it's, he's not just, the um the principal he is one of several principals and so he not like having him buy into the vision of this farm um it wouldn't have happened otherwise because i wouldn't be able to convince four other principals uh i don't know how to speak their language you know like they have lots of competing interests and they have their own vision for the school. And, you know, it's, it seems like it's almost always, there's never enough room on the table. So if I'm going to bring this project and put it on the table, that means something else is either going to have to come off or it's going to fall off. There's just not enough room on the table. So getting that buy-in from local administration is uh, incredibly important. You also have to um, have buy-in from local electeds. 
uh, and um, you know because they have access to uh, funding that they some of it is at their discretion some of it they can help uh, help you co-sign on they can say look you know I'm putting my reputation on this project um, and then even that is more of the easy part like it's incredibly difficult and I it cannot sing the praises of, of my boss, Kathy Saul enough because she is so good at doing that. Like watching her maintain and, and massage these relationships is exhausting. It's exhausting to watch her do it. So I can't imagine having to do it. And then like the depth of vision to, to be able to say like, whatever the most recent setback is, it's not the end. We're just going to keep on going forward um, and really only having to put a project to bed for, you know, once there's really no other options, that kind of tenacity is, I don't think you can learn it <laughs> to be honest with you. I don't think you can learn it. I think it's, I think it's bred into you. And, yeah. um, but then beyond, again, there's another layer of relationships where, you have to get teachers to buy in to these ideas and that to that they will also commit to bringing their classroom into these farms and then you have to get your custodial staff to buy in which again is integral you know the most some of the most productive relationships i've had in schools building farms are with the custodial staff because they are the gatekeepers they have all the keys figuratively and literally and so <laughs> they're more likely than not going to have to receive uh, a huge order of Unistrut steel or U-line wide, uh, wide span storage shelving, um, or there's gonna be a delivery of like a hundred gallons of liquid fertilizer, uh, or there's gonna be a leak and they're gonna have to clean it up or do triage. And so if you don't have that good rapport, yeah. you are not your farm is, is not going to be a thing yeah. it's not going to survive um yeah. and then comes the easy part uh well actually <laughs> then you have to have good rapport with your contractors because i do not have the skill set to add 200 amps of electricity into a room or to uh tie in an ro filter into the the plumbing of a school um, or to punch a hole in a wall to run a drain for a sink, you know, like I don't have those skill sets. So I have to make sure that I have a good rapport with my contractors so that at the very least we have a working professional relationship. So once all that's done, once everyone is on the same page, or at least the people who need to be on the page are, you've managed all of these nuanced and changing personal relationships then you get to the part of actually building the systems. You've got the room ready. You've got your floor plan laid out. Everyone is okay with the types of systems and the amount of produce they're going to yield. And you have an idea of how you're gonna get it to the people. And then you have to find a crew to build these systems. And one of the things that we benefit from working in New York City is through these paid volunteer programs, like the summer youth employment program where you can have um, uh, you, you know, young people from particular communities uh, be paid to work for you, with you, for you, under your direction. Mm. And so that works well with our mission of exposing, uh, exposing people who otherwise would not have known about this to these unique life experiences, this unique opportunity to build a farm in a middle school in Brownsville, but also get paid for it. Yeah. Uh, and then you can also somewhat dictate within that organization, the age range that um, should be working on this project. And that'll help you plan out, okay, well, I've got 18 to 20 year olds, I've got five of them coming in. So I want to make sure that I'm giving them the tasks that they're capable of either learning quickly or have already done. Um, and so at MLK, we had a few summer youth participants come in. They helped us put together the framing. So laying out the floor, uh, laying out the, the floor plan, 
putting together the framing and um, doing some of the more basic fabrication, like punching holes in flood trays, um, gluing together simple PVC assemblies. But then after that, um, we, our farmer educator, Michael Sternberg, helped me put together a good portion of the systems, which was, is, it's part of TFFJ's training so that you are more intimately familiar with how the systems are assembled. Um, so you can do quick triage if needed, but also just have a, a basic or, or more than a basic understanding of the equipment you'll be operating. Yeah. We also brought in local contractor, uh, Caleb Braff. Um, he's a local hydroponicist and he was a huge help in, in, getting at basically the commissioning of the systems and setting up the more complicated things like the auto grow dosing. And so, like I said, it's 80% collaborating with people. And then there's yeah. like this small, small thing of just kind of putting the systems together and making sure yeah. that they're properly, <laughs> like you would think it'd be the other way, but it's absolutely not. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. And I think, I mean, in a very small way, I, I know what you mean about making sure you're on good terms with like the superintendent of the building and because we have the same issue here in Tribeca we have the same issue at you know a couple of other farms and and it's if you're on good terms if you like if if you if you you know approach them as someone who you want to have a long-term working relationship with then things good things can happen and if you right. ignore if you ignore people and just assume or take them for granted uh, you know that's no way to that's no way to enter a building and it's no way to, you know, construct something that's going to be there for years. Yeah. So I totally agree. Um, if you had any advice for yourself five for five years ago, given the projects you've taken on and how you've tackled them, what, what do you think that might be? Um, I think, I think the first one probably put down the PVC glue because the initial systems <laughs> were, overly complicated yeah. and I was making a lot of custom parts. So when those custom parts failed, um, I have to build all new custom parts and it's expensive and it's time consuming and uh, systems that are not operating is yield lost. Um, and also uh, really reach out to your, your local networks um, there are other people who are at least casually interested in what you're doing and you never know what, uh, what information they have come across, but also, uh, don't be, don't be shy of reaching out to other professionals. Um, you know, we used to build vertical NFT systems. But after we had a consultation with uh, Henry Gordon Smith, our friend Henry, who is literally everywhere all of the time, <laughs> and one of his engineers, Javid, we switched over to shallow raft culture um, for a few key fail-safe reasons. You know, if your pump dies, your plants aren't dead in about 20 minutes. But in th with NFT, that is that is something that I have experienced over and over again. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah. Also, there's certain in system design, there's certain items that should be um, kind of like specialty items, right? So this is, you know, made for hydroponics, but a lot of them don't need to be, you know, there is no, you can build an effective system using plumbing parts um, just as easily as you can do it using like botanic care plumbing parts, but you probably build it for less and your supply chain in terms of replacement parts will be much more stable because you're not, you're, you're not have, you're not this little tangent of a branch of a supply chain. You're tapping into a, a supply chain that has lots of other people. It's not a lot of purchasing power. So the organizations, the companies that make these parts are going to make sure they make them in volume and you can take advantage of that and you can take yeah. advantage of bulk things. And, uh, but yeah, yeah, so pick where you want your specialization to be. And for the most part, it's not going to be in things like plumbing or what kind of pump you use. It's going to be once you get to a certain scale and things like automation processes and, uh, you know, what kind of lights you use. Yeah. Yeah. That's good advice. That's good advice. 
Um, so switching gear a little bit and just going back to the mission of Teens for Food Justice and thinking about the bigger picture, you know, food justice as a phrase, you know, it's in it's in that name. Um, right. I think it might mean a few things to a few different people. I'm curious, like, what does it mean to you? Yeah, it is. It is a it is a very it is a nebulous phrase. And I think that in, it's probably for the best that it is nebulous because I feel like it's one of those instances where it's better to include than exclude. And, but for me, um, food justice is, uh, equal access to this, to equal quality of food, um, and, uh, equal access to education about nutrition. I think those are two big pillars, uh, for me. So not only should everyone have the ability to buy, good food uh, for cheap. Also, the part of good food is good shelf life because one of the comments that we, or one of the, the kudos that we get is that we'll give a head of lettuce to, um, to a family, uh, uh, one of our students, and they'll come back and they'll say, that lasted for like two or three weeks in my fridge. And so they didn't have to worry about constantly throwing away food, which is literally constantly throwing away money that they didn't want to throw away. Um, and so just the, the quality of food in terms of shelf life has a huge impact because if you have any trepidation about buying healthy food that might sit around for a few days, you're not going to do it. You're going to go to a fast food joint that is hands down more convenient and might produce a little bit of leftovers, but not a whole lot. And you're not going to feel bad if you throw away you know, general sows from five days ago. You just don't have that same connection. Yeah, um, this is the, this is the, like, it's a real issue. And I, I think like with food waste in particular, there's a lot of rhetoric that essentially shames a consumer if they waste food. And, and it's like, oh, consumers are so wasteful. Blah, 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 blah. But, it, you know, when you look at it, if you buy a bag of spinach from the grocery store and then within three or four days, it's gone wet and, yeah. and, and unusable it's like well of course you're going to throw it out and yeah. and and actually what's been so um you know positive and i know you're having this ex experience as well we have this experience with our customers like you get them some product and it's harvested same day it's in a great container they put it in the fridge and it will literally stay fresh for more than two weeks and it's it's so different to the experience of buying it from a wholesaler or buying it from a grocery store mm -hmm. and i th i think a lot of people don't realize this about vertical farming it's like it's actually maybe if not the top reason to do it it's like up there in terms of having yeah. food produced locally very very short distance from from harvest uh to delivery and so it's it's really cool that you guys are noticing and, oh yeah you know I mean, in terms of like like food miles i mean it'll be it'll be years before one of our farms racks up you know a significant amount of food miles like especially compared to growing a head of lettuce in arizona and then shipping it to new york for consumption yeah. once the seed has been delivered all of our farms are like a few hundred yards away from right where they're going to be consumed so and and so the food mileage is is virtually non-existent, especially if you define food mileage in like the fuel it took to move that because we're walking it downstairs. You know, we're not yeah. hopping in a truck to bring <laughs> it around the front of the building. Yeah. Um, also, changing your personal eating habits, it, it, they are just that they're habits and it takes a while for you to be able to change them. So there's this compound negative effect. Like you said, if, if I buy a bag of spinach because I have the genuine want to change my eating habits. And then by the time I, my, my mind is in a place where I can go, Oh, I should use that spinach. It's turned into, you know, like a, a, a sort of spinachy mucus. I'm going to throw <laughs> the whole thing away. And then I'm going to say, well, that was a waste. And also that behavior was a waste of my time and money. Yeah. And so it's this compound negative effect. So it's going to reinforce bad eating habits uh, just because you feel like you're throwing, you've just thrown away that effort. You've thrown away that money in the act of throwing away spoiled food. Yeah. So Yeah, no, totally. And it's, uh, 
I, I'm I'm glad though that there is you know there is a solution to this whether it's mm. you know growing food on on site in the school or growing food in a community and then distributing that somehow and like I I believe strongly that you know the technology for vertical farming gets gradually cheaper it gets gradually easier to use there's right. more and more people who know how to do it and so access to this food at an affordable price which is still somewhat problematic with vertical farming but right at an affordable price becomes you know accessible to everyone so yeah. so i'm i'm positive that it will gradually get better and i think folks like you are, are really really part of that push and and i think like the the funny thing is sometimes people just need to see it to then copy it to be right. honest, and then just yeah. do it. You know, now they know. Okay, that someone has built a farm in a school. Someone has done it many times now, actually. And like, you know, you can do it too, or you can be part of that. Um, right. Which leads me to ask, like, you know, if people are listening to this and they work at a school or they're part of a school, or they, you know, and they want to get involved with Teens for Food Justice, what's the best way um, to kind of start that conversation? Right. So, uh, like I said earlier, it's a very collaborative process. A lot of this. Um, a lot of the introductions that we make or are made for us are through word of mouth. So the best way to get involved is uh, to, a good place to start is our website. That's teensforfoodjustice.org. Um, there's a lot of information there about our farms, our program, who our staff is. Um, you know, uh, it goes into more depth about our, our mission and our goal and the history of Teens for Food Justice. Um, and for any uh, anyone, any any students that might be listening, you know, we got into Manhattan Hunter Science High School. That's the farm that that I'm calling MLK. It's shorthand. The, the actual school we're in is the Manhattan Hunter Science High School. Um, that was students came to one of our farms, came to our farm in the Bronx, and then advocated for it uh, to Kevin Froner. So. Um, that sort of collaborative word of mouth is incredibly important. So uh, there's a wealth of information about TFFJ at teensforfoodjustice.org. Great, right, very cool. And and talking about the other work that you do, I think I originally met you through the New York City Agriculture Collective. Um, you know, there's a lot of folks that we know mutually there. Yeah. Tell us more about that. We've never really talked about that on the podcast and. Um, yeah, I think our listeners are curious, like, what is the Agriculture Collective? What do you do? Why are you involved? Uh, you know, what's it all about? So, um, yeah, so that actually is where you and I first met. And again, the, the, er, like the ag tech community in this, in the city is shockingly small, um, <laughs> because it's the same faces over and over, which is great because they're all lovely people, but that is where, um, I kind of started getting dug in. So at that time, which would have been 2016, I think the yeah. Ag Collective was the sort of um, it was it was like a, a communal. You had to be in the the industry, and then you had to interview to get in. And it was nonprofits and uh, local entrepreneurs trying to sort of build community and 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 see what could be made of it. And over the years, the faces have changed. Uh, you know, many of the the original founders have have moved on because of success, which is fantastic. You know, and I mean, you're sorely missed, Rob. You're welcome back Aww. anytime. No yeah. questions asked. Uh, yeah, yeah. There will be a hazing, but <laughs> so, but what we've what we have like kind of shifted into. Um, is uh, 501c3. Uh, we actually just got confirmation from the IRS that our paperwork was uh, approved Congrats. earlier today. So I'm Great. actually really happy about that because that was a long, it was a long process. Um, and so there's just a few more steps left uh, actually internally to, to New York City because this is a difficult place to run a nonprofit. And, um, but our, our mission now is to remove barriers to entry for individuals who want to start their career in ag tech. We do that through networking events um, such as Fresh in February or Ag Tech Week. Um, those are our two big tentpole events. And then uh, we're doing everything we can really to leverage our network um, to bring 
bring interested parties and people seeking knowledge together with either people who can mentor them or just with resources that'll help them further their journey in ag tech um, in the city. Uh, so, you know, we have some, we have some uh, events uh, that we're kind of, we're trying to formulate and trying to, right now we have a, a very marked um, boom bust with Ag Tech Week being in conjunction with Climate Week. You know, we get a lot of attention and a lot of engagement there and it's fantastic. And then there's kind of nothing until February. And then, you know, again, so we have Fresh in Feb, which is Fresh in February, which is a, a one night showcase of the produce that you can get uh, locally, uh, the local produce you can get in the dead of a New York winter. And then they, again, there's another kind of lull until Ag Tech Week the next year. So we're going to, we're trying to figure out ways, um, that we can kind of f flatten the curve to use a phrase <laughs> definitely invented. Um, and, yeah. and, well, speaking of which, I mean, is Fresh in February going to be happening this year? Um, I know you, you did a sort of virtual ag tech week last year. Yeah. Like, what's what's going on this year, do you think? So we, we're, it won't be in, it is happening, but it's going to be very, very different. So um, what we're trying to do, because it's not safe to have these gatherings um, and part like the the crux of fresh in february is sharing food is eating and having those in-person interactions um so we're going to spend february um working out how we can highlight new york city's growers how we can and bring basically can can bring consumers to them and so we have uh that's that's going to be our fresh in feb this year yeah. is how can we take the heart and soul of fresh in February um, and basically pivot it to COVID? You know, we did it for Ag Tech Week and it was difficult. It was difficult to do. And I miss Ag Tech Week's past because there's really nothing like the, the frantic scavenger hunt of going from one place to another throughout the city and the friendships made and then, you know, the, the, the toasts and the networking events and all of it's, it's great. It's great to be surrounded yeah. by that community. Yeah. And so there was a certain amount of, uh, you know, uh, sadness having to take it virtual. And, yeah. but you know, this is the reality that we are in, you yeah. know, um, and the only thing worse than not having an event, would be having an event where people are getting sick, where we're not actually protecting the community that we love and building yeah. it. Yeah. So we're going to be pivoting fresh and fed. I don't know if it's going to be a discrete event, you know, the, like it has been in, in years past, but we, it's definitely not been shelved. So. Cool. Cool. Yeah. I mean, personally, I've always loved, um, the ag tech, um, or ag collective events and, you know, we certainly have had people here during Ag Tech Week come and visit the farm. We had great panel discussions. Um, I think it's it's always a place where you meet super enthusiastic people, right? You meet people who are thinking of maybe doing a career change. You know, you, think, you meet people who are out of college. Um, and I've always been struck by just the amount of passion that people have and the amount of curiosity they have. And you'll get, you know, a group of people come in and some people will be obsessed with the engineering or they'll be asking you a hundred questions about <laughs> like this tray, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and then other folks, are you know, got ideas for starting up new businesses and stuff. And, and I, I think it's always been great. And I, you know, it, it actually doesn't, it's a year ago now pretty much, but I remember fresh in February last year and we had that at project farmhouse and, and mm -hmm. there was opportunities to kind of see what everyone's doing and talk. And there's always just, you know, a lot of positivity, right? There's, I think, yeah. you know, people who are doing urban ag in New York city, are, are like by default, very positive people. And you kind of have to be, to get through some of the, you know, difficulties and, um, <laughs> you gotta be optimistic. But, Absolutely. <laughs> you do. Um, yeah, but also do. I think that it, it shows that, um, 
you know, people really care about this stuff and people see solutions everywhere. And I think that, of course, you know, there are larger companies that have raised lots of money. There are sort of like more established kind of greenhouse type businesses, but also there's just lots of people doing little things and doing you know, right. little community garden projects, doing little things with food. And, and for me, that is more, that's the thing that I get really, um, I feel really good about, you know, it's like real people doing small things. And that's, that's something that's at the heart of the agriculture collective. And, you know, yeah, yeah. so I, I share your, Sadness that we can't do it, but of course, you know, um, we have to kind of hang on. And, and I think, um, you know, I think everyone appreciates that. And and mm. so talking of, you know, COVID, I can't get away with like not mentioning. I, of of course, course I'm sure that's been difficult for Teams for Food Justice. Uh, yeah. Do you, you know, what's the sort of situation now and how do you think things are gonna evolve over the next year for you guys? And what's, how, how have you responded to this? So, yeah, I mean, one of the it's it is working working in schools as we do is both incredibly unique and rewarding and also its own unique challenges and so when the doe closed schools in mid-march last year tffj had to shut down our school-based farms um for me personally that was very that was very frustrating because at the time, there was uh, there was a lot of concern about how will NYC's food supplies, like food chains, manage this? How is this going to affect? Because there's already so much hunger in the city, and now you're shutting down um, the place where a, a lot, a, a significant amount of either unstable housed or homeless students get consistent meals yeah. um and then to also know that what you do for a living is build the infrastructure that could help address these issues to have that not be considered is very is very frustrating it was hard to deal with and it was it was yeah it was a very disillusioned time for me personally um but tffj is is made up of people far more resilient than i am and so after harvesting and donating almost a thousand pounds of our produce from our sites, that's from the Bronx, from, uh, from our site in Bed-Stuy, from Manhattan, um, we started connecting with other local hydroponic growers um, to, to push that produce to, directly to the communities that needed them. Um, so we currently run uh, weekly and bi-weekly food distributions in four school partner communities so in, in Kingsbridge in the Bronx, that's near DeWitt Clinton's uh, our high school campus out in Brownsville in Brooklyn um, and at, at our uh, Brownsville Collaborative Middle School in Far Rockaway in Queens, even though our farm is not even open yet, um, we're, we're doing biweekly or weekly or biweekly food distribution and uh, the Lincoln Center in Hell's Kitchen near our near the MLK educational campus. Um, where we largely serve uh, the NYCHA's Amsterdam houses. So those distributions have brought up to, or, or benefit up to a thousand households a week. So- That's amazing. That's so cool. Yeah, you know, and, and even though we would love for, we would love to be the producers of whatever we can do to put into these boxes, the fact that, you know, the, people at TFFJ just didn't, they didn't throw up their hands. Again, I credit it up to Kathy because this is, this is her brainchild and her dream and her vision and to watch it be, be so existentially threatened, but then to still pivot and say, we can still get food out to these uh, communities is, is next level. That's so uh, great. And, and then, so oh, go on, on. please go on. No, 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 please. No, I was going to say, it sounds like you, you have a really great culture at, at the organization. And, you know, I'm sure a lot of that comes from Kathy. It comes from the folks on the team. Um, I was going to ask like, if someone wanted to end up in your job in a few years time in a similar organization, what, what's a good path to get there and what kind of traits, attributes, you know, skills do they need to kind of build up to, to make them an, a great candidate for an organization like TFFJ? 
It's a good question. I mean, so my job in a few years, they're going to, I mean, there's definitely going to be like a knife fight or something because I love my job. So, <laughs> like, I wasn't specifically saying I mean, they have like, to take your job. Me, but... I guess the trade is don't miss because, <laughs> no. What you need, what you need to do. Yeah, I guess there is. I'm trying to think how I did it. <laughs> and and then distill that into a pathway that makes sense. Yeah. When I came into the city, I knew I knew that I was going to have to um, do more for very little. So there was a lot of volunteering. So I guess what what you really need to do is kind of understand that nothing you're doing is going to happen in a vacuum. So if you're trying to get into uh, urban ag, or if you're trying to get into an agricultural based nonprofit, find the people that are already doing it, find the organizations that already exist. I mean, there's Harlem grown, there's green Bronx machine, uh, just foods. These are all grow NYC city harvest. These are organizations that already are doing it. And, um, I happily accept volunteer work. And I know that that can be, that can seem like a non-starter if you're kind of living off of your savings or maybe you're not living off your savings and you just kind of have to make do with what you can to then volunteer your time. It's like one of the few things that you don't feel like you have any of. And so you, what gets you through that is um, really believing in the mission, really finding something that will get you out of bed on Saturday and you can go to a food box distribution or you can go in and volunteer at a Grow NYC event and hand out flyers and make connections with the people that are already doing it. That's that's how you get into really any community, but that's how I got into the urban ag community in the city. And the I would love I would love to say that there is a particular skill set that predisposes you to building hydroponic systems, but I don't think it exists. Like, I feel like you could go to school for hydroponic systems, which I didn't even do. Like I am unique in having a background in agriculture, but one of the things that's really impressive is that the community in ag tech in the city comes from varied backgrounds. You know, there's people who have MBAs. I met one guy who got a master's in making prosthetics, like, and and decided that he wanted to move into urban ag um so i think that kind of circling back to what i said earlier on how fundamental agriculture is to everything that we do you can literally do anything plus agriculture so maybe you have a background in marketing or maybe you have a background in psychology there are ways to take those skills and apply it through the lens of agriculture you know farmers need to uh sell their crops and to do that they need to have you know a logo and uh, uh advertising story and all of the things that you would learn if you had a background in advertising that have that aren't just for agriculture but you can apply it that way or maybe your background in psychology uh has taught you or giving you insight onto how people think and you can do things like manage a workforce at a farm or uh, come and, and design operational materials. You know, there's the, I think, yeah, you need to buy into the mission. You need to be willing to go the extra mile um, just on, on your own moxie and then seek out community as quickly as possible because you know, like you were saying about how positive fresh and fed, like the community around fresh in February or ag tech week is people like seeing their interests reflected yeah. in other people. Yeah. So if you come to the table and say, hey, I also love this and I want to add to it, you will be positively received. Yeah. Yeah. That's good advice. And and sort of to to wrap up here a little bit, I want to ask you something that's a little bit more kind of pie in the sky vision kind of thing. Sure. You know, if you were if you were running um, New York City's urban agriculture initiative, 
Mm. What what would you want to try to achieve within the next t- 10 years? Where do you think it could get to? And what do we need to change to kind of get to where we could get to as a city uh, to, to, to be great at urban ag? 10 years. All right. Well, I'm already drunk with power. So <laughs> yeah, no corruption, please. <laughs> no, I think that uh, I think some of the barriers to entry to urban ag slash ag tech in the city is just it's New York. It's an expensive place to exist. So any sort of subsidies that we can provide um, to the people who want to, you know, run a startup here would be fantastic. Um, any sort of accelerators that are f- like heavily funded by the city would be, would have a night and day impact, you know? Um, I also think that uh, there are too many vacant lots I, and not enough gardens. And I love growing stuff indoors. Like I love being an inside farmer, but matter of fact is, is that, it, you know, a vacant lot doesn't help anyone. And, uh, you know, some of the stories I've heard from local, uh, you know, community gardener, community advocates, people like Karen Washington or uh, Keith Carr, they have, they have, they've gone through it. You know, I remember one of my, one of my first, Oh man, it was like a, a city planning meeting or something that I went to. Uh, Keith Carr was there talking about how he had chained himself to bulldozers and been arrested for to protect community gardens. He shouldn't have to do that. He shouldn't have to do that. That that is a fundamental failing of of the local government. Yeah. Of its you know by by the local government of its people. So if we want to be the best, if we want people to point to New York as a city for urban ag and urban ag tech, we have to support those, those people who are doing it. Um, and, and yeah, so that's what I would do. I think that there's, there's probably ways we can shift how money moves through the city and make yeah. sure that there's incentives for green space and there's decentives for people holding empty lots, who, you know, just kind of waiting for someone with buckets of money to want to develop it. You know, I think that yeah. that's, uh, that's regressive, you know, all you'll end up is with empty lots. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, you got my vote. Uh, Excellent. if that counts, <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I want to say thank you, Harrison. If there's any last things that you think people should know about Teens for Food Justice or the New York City Agriculture Collective, now's the time uh, for some parting words there. Um, yeah, I mean, please, uh, please go to teensforfoodjustice.org. Um, check us out. We're on, you can find our Instagram handles and Twitter. We're on social media. Uh, I know that the collective is got a fledgling TikTok. We're ag tech talk. Oh, oh, I didn't know this. Oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Stuff. Okay. Stay All tuned. Right. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> All right. um, but also we're, you know, we're not the only two organizations doing things. Go out, find, find, you know, do the easy part, go online and find um, community advocates. You know, like I said, like Karen Washington, I know she's on Instagram at car washer, car washer with a K she's been doing this, um, you know, and then from there branch out, find community based organizations that align with your, your personal mission and then donate money. If you can, if you can't donate time. Um, and I mean, I think that, uh, and it's, I don't know, it's, it's a, it's a sticky thing to talk about, but, these community-based organizations are are largely led by people of color and so for white people looking to help go go help but don't go to lead go to be led go to listen to them amplify their voices um because they're more intimately aware than you are especially if it's your first time volunteering yeah go there to be about it not to post about it you know what i mean and and understand um that you you should not have the aim of adopting their cause 
you should yeah. be there to help support them. And uh, but yeah, yeah, so that's what I would that's what I would say. Great advice. Great way to end. Uh, I want to say thank you, Harrison. It's just been super interesting for me. I feel like thank I've learned a lot. Um, me. Yeah, I'm really inspired what you guys are doing. And I, I, I'm so sure that, you know, post COVID, there's going to just be more and more of these farms and it's going to be um, really inspiring to people, not just in America, but I think around the world, I just think it's a great model. I think what you're doing is awesome. And I think that the more we can get uh, kids in front of food, around food, you know, in part of the process of making food, you know, it's a little, it's another little step to to fixing the food system and fixing, you know, food equality. Um, and I'm I'm really inspired by it. So I'm I'm glad we could chat today. Yeah, thank you for having me. This is great. Thank you. All right. <laughs>